want you to hit me as hard as you can. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's Who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hello, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're heading to school on a Saturday as we kick it with The Breakfast Club. Written, produced, and directed by Hughes, the film explores teenagers from different high school cliques who were forced together in Saturday detention. Around the summer of 1983, as filming came to an end on Hughes' directorial debut, Sixteen Candles, Hughes asked his two stars, Molly Ringwald and Anthony Michael Hall, to be in his next project, a little film called The Breakfast Club. Hughes recounted that he intended The Breakfast Club to be his first feature film in the director's chair. However, his request to direct the project was met with resistance and skepticism because he lacked filmmaking experience. On another note, Universal execs complained that there were no bare breasts, no party scenes, no guys drinking beer, you know, things that they thought a teen flick needed at the time. Ultimately, Hughes convinced the investors that the modest $1 million budget in its single location shoot would minimize their risk. The screenplay by Hughes was written in just two days, very similar to how quickly Sixteen Candles was penned too. The film's title comes from the nickname invented by students and staff for detention at New Trier High School, which was attended by the son of one of Hughes' friends. Those who were sent to detention were designated involuntary members of The Breakfast Club. The term could have also originated from a defunct but long-running radio program based in Chicago called Don McNeil's Breakfast Club. Now, before we continue further, we'd like to thank you for watching John Hughes Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. The film assembled a small, intimate young group of actors known affectionately as the Brat Pack. Hall was the first actor to sign up for the film, playing Brian, or The Brain. Molly Ringwald stars as Claire, the princess. Originally, she was approached to play the basket case, but she was really upset because she wanted to play the princess. Other actors considered for the role were Robin Wright, Jodie Foster, and Laura Dern. Eventually, Ringwald convinced Hughes and the studio to give her the part. Her entire outfit was purchased specifically for the character from a Ralph Lauren store, the only one in Chicago at the time. As for where Paul Gleason got his outfit from? Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? The role of Allison, the basket case, went to Ali Sheedy. Fun fact, she was almost cast in the lead role of Sam Baker in 16 Candles instead of Ringwald. When Sheedy auditioned for that film, she had two black eyes from a set building accident. A, what the fuck was happening on that set? And B, the black eyes gave her a dark gothic image, which stayed with Hughes. So when it came time to cast the part of Allison, he remembered and called up Sheedy. Emilio Estevez initially auditioned for the role of John Bender, the criminal, since it was more in line with the type of roles that Estevez had previously played. However, when Hughes was unable to find someone for the role of the athlete, Estevez was recast. Hughes had also considered Michael J. Fox, Jim Carrey, Rob Lowe, Tom Cruise, and future Ferris Bueller, Matthew Broderick. Judd Nelson nabbed the standout role of Bender, with other actors considered for the part being Jim Carrey, again, John Cusack, and Nicolas Cage himself. The production could not afford to pay Cage's salary at the time, so Hughes cast Cusack as John Bender, which had the actor traveling between Chicago and Los Angeles for rehearsals. In the end, Hughes went in a different direction and replaced him with Nelson right before shooting started because Cusack did not look threatening enough for the role. Before Universal chose Sixteen Candles as the more commercially viable film, John's sister, Joan Cusack, was set to play Allison. Hughes gave them both consolation roles on Sixteen Candles to make up for this. To prepare for his role, Nelson went undercover at a local high school outside Chicago near where the crew was shooting. He was able to convince the teenagers that he was a legitimate student by buying beer for them with his fake ID. He was 24 at the time. He also went to a laundromat in character, but the looks he was giving to a woman there caused a paranoid bystander to dial 911 on him. Bender's clothes seen in the film are the same ones Nelson auditioned in for the role. Even the switchblade he used in the film actually belonged to Nelson, and he explained that he had it for protection. Paul Gleason plays authoritarian vice principal Richard Vernon. The character is based on a wrestling coach from Hughes High School who flunked him in gym. 
Years later, Hughes ran into him and the coach said the movie was good, but the teacher was a real jerk. The next time I have to come in here, I'm cracking skulls. Rick Moranis was cast as Carl the janitor first. He grew a thick beard and decided to play the character with a Russian accent. Hughes was on board to let Moranis reinterpret the character, but producer Ned Tannen was so opposed to Moranis' comical creative liberties that he replaced him with John Capellos who Hughes had worked with on 16 Candles. During filming, Capellos rarely associated with the other cast members to maintain a feeling of isolation. Hughes had also cast Karen Lee Hopkins as Robin, a gym teacher who gives the teens advice. However, Ringwald, Sheedy, and producer Michelle Manning objected to a scene in which Robin was seen nude in the locker room, likely created to appease execs, so Hughes removed her character and gave her scenes to Carl. Once again, like in 16 Candles, the only two actors of the main cast that were actually teens were Ringwald and Hall. Everyone else was well into their 20s. Hughes even pulls a Hitchcock and gives himself a cameo in this film, playing the brief role of Brian's dad. Well, we're not supposed to study, we just have to sit there and do nothing. Well, mister, you figure out a way to study. Yeah. Principal photography kicked off on March 28, 1984, and wrapped of May of that year. Filming took place at Maine North High School in Illinois, which had been closed since May 1981. The same setting was used for interior scenes of another Hughes film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. There's actually a fun theory that this film takes place in the same universe as Ferris Bueller, with Vice Principal Vernon working under Principal Ed Rooney. The library at the high school was deemed too small for the film, which prompted the crew to build a virtually identical but larger set in the school's gymnasium, which was a common tactic on Hughes projects. The actors all rehearsed for three weeks and then shot the film in sequence. On the Ferris Bueller's Day Off commentary, Hughes admitted that he shot both films concurrently to save time and money. Contrary to reports that Ali Sheedy shook her real dandruff onto her pencil drawing, that effect was achieved by sprinkling Parmesan cheese. She did, however, really eat the sandwich filled with pixie sticks and Captain Crunch cereal, just as it appears in the final film. In reality, Molly Ringwald could not do that cool lipstick trick. They had to use different camera angles to make it appear that she could, courtesy of cinematographer Thomas Del Ruth. Judd Nelson continued to stay in character off camera, and at one point during shooting, Hughes was disappointed with Nelson because he harassed Ringwald off camera as part of his process. You are a bitch! Apparently, he would make fun of her blind musician father, touch on other hot button issues, and bully her. And the Susanna Gora's book, You Couldn't Ignore Me If You Tried, which is taken from a line from this film, You couldn't ignore me if you tried. Ringwald said she so knew what Nelson was doing and was not phased by his method actor attacks. However, Hughes was not so tolerant and understanding. He almost fired Nelson because of his antics. The other actors, including Paul Gleason, defended Nelson and convinced Hughes not to fire him, saying that Nelson was a good actor and trying to get into character. After the film wrapped, Hughes said he would never work with Nelson again because he was basically acting like his psychopath punk character on the set the whole time. During the scene where all the main characters sit in a circle on the library floor and tell each other about why they were in detention was not scripted. So that's how Hughes is able to write these scripts in two days. Hughes was really receptive to the actors' improvisations and told them all to ad-lib their stories. Some on-the-spot lines, including Brian's reason for having a fake ID, so I can vote, made into the film. Judd Nelson even made up many of the terms used in the film. You're a neo maxi zoom dweeby. And the joke that Bender tells while crashing through the ceiling but never finishes actually has no punchline. It was just another line that Nelson ad-libbed. Originally, he was supposed to tell a joke that would end when he came back into the library and said, Forgot my pencil. But no one could come up with a punchline. He even improvised this. <laughs> Gross. During the dance sequence, only Claire was scripted to dance, but Ringwald felt uncomfortable dancing by herself, so Hughes had the entire cast dance along with her, with them voting that Chidi was the best dancer. Surprisingly, Ringwald has expressed regret over this decision, because not only did she think her dancing was bad, her inability to do the dance solo led to the cheesy choreographed dance routine, which she feels hurt the movie. I have to disagree with her. That sequence wouldn't be the same without all the characters getting in on the fun. It also provided some much-needed catharsis for everyone involved. However, Ringwald wasn't the only one with regrets, as Hughes had his own about this same sequence but this time it was the use of the breaking glass effect that he wished he could remove. Once again, I respectfully disagree. That effect really punctuates the entire montage. Also, my dude got so high that he really busted out cartwheels and screamed so loud that the glass broke. Damn. 
we all could use some of that. According to Judd Nelson, Anthony Michael Hall went through a growth spurt during production. At the start, Hall was shorter than him, but by the end, he was taller than Nelson. This isn't Hall's first rodeo, as he also went through a growth spurt on the set of National Lampoon's Vacation, with him becoming taller than his sister Audrey by the end. For the final shot, Judd Nelson improvised the action where Bender raises his fist in defiance. In the script, the character was supposed to just walk into the sunset, but Hughes asked him to play around. When he was done and they were finishing up, Nelson threw up his fist without running it by anyone. Naturally, everyone loved it, and since then, the shot has become an iconic symbol of the 80s, as well as cemented forever in cinema history. As production wrapped, Hughes gifted each actor a piece of the library's banister to commemorate the shoot. That's what I thought. The Breakfast Club was released nationwide on February 15, 1985. For the time, the budget was very low, equating to about $2.5 million today. It received an A from both critics and the box office, raking in a total of $51.5 million worldwide, equivalent to over $130 million in today's money. Not bad. Roger Ebert awarded the film three stars, and it marked the start of Hollywood's heightened interest in producing teen movies, leading to a sort of renaissance for the genre. The first cut of the film was two and a half hours in length, with the final film being cut down to just 97 minutes. In 2018, the Criterion Collection released a special edition containing new features such as 50 minutes of deleted and extended scenes previously unavailable on a home format. One scene in particular has Carl predicting where the five kids will be in 30 years, six facelifts and two boob jobs by the time you're 40, and a husband with more girlfriends than anniversaries. Similar to Home Alone, there was originally supposed to be a dream sequence. Allison imagines Andrew as a gluttonous Viking, Bender as a prisoner, Claire as a bride, Brian as an astronaut, and herself as a vampire, naturally. And if you'd like to spend more time with these characters, I highly recommend checking out the rest of the footage left on the cutting room floor. Of course, we'd be remiss not to discuss the indelible soundtrack, specifically the song that bookends the film. The soundtrack features evocative music of the 80s and was produced by British pop musician Keith Forsey, who also wrote the theme song. Don't you forget about me. Forsey was also the composer of the film, and he was chosen because he was a drummer, and Hughes was keen on having the score be heavy on drums and bass to mirror the emotions of the characters. The iconic song reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The David Bowie quote that opens the film is pulled from his song Changes. Ali Sheedy suggested this quote to Hughes, who liked it and included it in the opening. <laughs> the movie was initially conceived as the start of a franchise with subsequent sequels checking in on the characters every 10 years or so. Obviously, this did not come to pass due to the volatile relationship between John Hughes and Judd Nelson. I'm hurt. Also, at the time, it was unclear whether or not Hughes still held ill will against his off-cast starlet, Molly Ringwald. The same applied to Anthony Michael Hall, as they both had a falling out with Hughes in the late 80s after the two young stars decided to move on from the teen film genre to pursue more adult roles, effectively severing their relationships with Hughes. In the 2001 parody film, Not Another Teen Movie, Leeson reprised his role as Vice Principal Vernon in a short scene that spooks The Breakfast Club. Cry me a river, dickface. You just bought yourself another one. And Ringwald had a small cameo, too. I love you, too. We all know where this is going. Fucking teenagers. In 2012, the TV show Victorious aired their own version of the film titled The Breakfast Bunch. Very clever. Even the Autobots are a fan of the film, as it was honored in 2018's Bumblebee. Dozens and dozens of films have cited The Breakfast Club as an influence, ranging from Spider-Man Homecoming to Paranorman. After the film became a huge hit, Hughes was asked to write the script as a play so that high schoolers could perform it. A few schools actually tried it out, with one shutting down production 10 minutes into its second act, due to, what else, overbearing parents. The Breakfast Club has been called the quintessential 1980s film and considered to be John Hughes' magnum opus. It was the rebel without a cause of its generation and gave a voice to the contemporary American teenager and offered both a humorous and sobering exploration of angst, trauma, and social classes. 
The film's iconic poster, featuring the five characters huddled together as a family, influenced the way that teen films were marketed from that point on. Even other genre films got in on the fun, with the horror comedy Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 lampooning The Breakfast Club's poster. Even Bender uses the phrase, eat my shorts, years before a Mr. Bart Simpson ever utters those three words. Eat. My. Shorts. In a meta full circle moment, when on Futurama, Bender the Robot, who by the way was named by the show creator Matt Groening for The Breakfast Club's Bender, finds a Bart Simpson doll that says, my shorts. Okay. Mmm, shorts. In 2016, the film was inducted into the U.S. National Film Registry to be preserved due to its cultural significance. The main theme of the film is the constant struggle of the American teenager to be understood by adults and by themselves. It explores the pressures put on teenagers to fit into their own realms of high school social constructs, as well as the lofty expectations of their parents, teachers, and other authority figures. On the surface, the students have little in common with each other, but as the day goes on, they eventually bond over a common disdain of peer pressure and societal expectations. Another major theme is stereotyping. At the start, the characters put each other into a box and label them. Well, I'll just run right out and join the wrestling team. <laughs> Maybe the prep club too. Student council. No, they wouldn't take you. Once the obvious stereotypes are broken down, the characters learn to empathize with each other's struggle, dismiss some of the inaccuracies of their first impressions, and discover that they are more similar than different. Even Brian's choice of shop class plays into this theme. I thought I was playing it real smart, you know, because I thought, I'll take shop and maybe it's an easy way to maintain my grade point average. Why'd you think it'd be easy? While Moranis would have been funny in the role of Carl, I'm grateful we didn't get his over-the-top Russian stereotype. That probably would have undercut the film's message. I really do love the scene between Vernon and Carl the janitor. It hints that Vernon has likely experienced burnout in terms of his job. Having student after student sent to his office for discipline over the years seems to have taken a toll on him. <sighs> Vernon doesn't like his job much anymore and is actually serving his own form of detention, forced to spend his whole Saturday at school too. Vernon says to Carl that he thinks the student attitudes have changed over the years and he's scared that the kids he deals with will one day be running the country. Carl counters by saying it's actually Vernon's attitude that's changed, and the kids are pretty much still the same. Come on, Vern, the kids haven't changed, you have. And Carl's right. There will always be kids getting in trouble like Bender. Just as I'm sure Vernon got into his fair share of trouble back in the day. I also love the blink and miss it moment in the opening sequence, displaying a plaque with Carl the janitor as Shermer High's Man of the Year. It's such a great minor detail that really adds a lot of depth to the character and plays into the film's themes of not judging a book by its cover. Recently, in light of the Me Too movement, Molly Ringwald described watching the film with her 10-year-old daughter. Ringwald recalls the time where she and her mother tried to persuade Hughes to scrap the scene where Bender peeks at Claire's panties as she's sitting at her desk in a short skirt, but Hughes refused. <gasps> Ringwald said he hired an adult woman as a stand-in for the shot because Ringwald was a minor at that point and didn't think it was legal to film a minor's panty-covered crotch. You know, she's probably right. But she said that even having another person pretend to be her was embarrassing and upsetting to her mother, even though they both knew about the scene when Ringwald accepted the role. Today, she finds the crowd-pleasing romance between her character and Bender difficult to root for now. I hate you. Yeah? Good. Bender spends most of the movie harassing Claire, just leave me alone. And how is Bender rewarded for all this bullying? By having Claire kiss him, give him her earring, and essentially start a relationship with him. Ringwald herself has discussed how disturbed she is by all this. Why don't you go close that door? We'll get the prom queen impregnated. Particularly about the mixed messages this sends to her daughter in the next generation. Additionally, Ali Sheedy said in 2020 that she disliked her character's end of the film makeover, where Allison's appearance is transformed covering her in blush and eyeshadow, and giving her a pink dress and headband to wear. Sheedy didn't like the message it relayed, that she had to change herself to get a boy to notice her. Sheedy and Ringwald tried to petition Hughes to change it to promote a less negative message. She didn't want Claire to put makeup on Allison's face, and had hoped that her physical transformation would involve merely slipping off her enormous black sweater and wearing with pride the plain white shirt she had on underneath. But Hughes didn't go for that. It was the 80s, and they wanted their ugly duckling becomes a swan transition. And although she was bothered by scenes of sexual harassment in this film, Ringwald stood by the work, recognizing that these issues were a product of the times, and that Hughes' films were still beneficial in helping teens assert their independence and identity. 
In interviews, Ringwald has said that this movie is about the universal feeling we all have, especially in high school, that we are all outsiders, we all feel alone, and yet we all want to be accepted. If there's something we could all take away from the film, it's the notion that even though, despite our labels, we can come together and realize that we're not so different from one another. Overall, I give The Breakfast Club 9 out of 10 raised fists.